Pencil Kings, 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 Pencil Kings. Failure is it's just one more thing that you're going to forget about when success finds you. Okay, we are back. This is the Pencil Kings podcast, and we're talking today to Jonah Loeb. I was just reading one of the articles on your site and it brought back some really um I don't, it kind of made me sad a little bit actually reading reading that article but not necessarily in a bad way just to sad in a way that I appreciated a friend who had uh passed away young and who had really inspired me and so um I just want to start off by saying thank you for for writing that and like giving my, me that experience of kind of reliving my friend's life and remembering him and um welcome to the call Let's get let's get out of sad mode. Let's get back into happy, <laughs> upbeat uh, mode. And so, why don't you tell people um, just like a, a one minute overview of what you're working on now, and also sp- splice in some things you've worked on in the past because you've worked on some some pretty cool projects that I think that a lot of people will have seen or interacted with these projects. Totally. Yeah. Well, hello to everybody listening. My name is Jonah Loeb. I was a developer at Bethesda Softworks for seven years. I was a character artist, so I specialized. My my particular realm was kind of monsters and creatures and that kind of thing, in addition addition to other character assets. So I've done like, I did like the Skyrim uh, dragon and I did did, like the Fallout death claws and and kind of, I mean, a, a, a whole host of others, but I think those are probably the the capital, uh, you know, those are the big hits, I suppose. And then what I'm up to these days is uh, I left Bethesda about three years ago and I've been writing a book. It kind of had been a dream of mine for a very long time. And I'm also doing a lot of internet streaming, like a lot of art streaming um, on Twitch and trying to proliferate as best I can uh, real knowledge and uh, artistic uh, know-how to the masses because I think that right now, you know, as kind of demonstrated by the fact that we're even having this podcast, the the line or the boundaries between who we perceive to be people of great, the people that, that we want to be, the people we want to grow up with and the, and the positions we want to have in life, uh, the, the boundary between you and, and those people and reaching them is so much smaller now. So I found that with Twitch and my live streaming, I've found that I can reach a lot of people uh, very easily uh, every day. Uh, and basically try to give of myself and of my time because it's one thing for me to learn all these things that I've learned and to keep them for myself. It's quite another to be able to do that and do it in front of strangers so that other people can really absorb and ask questions and and, and be present. And then the third thing I'm doing is uh, assorted contract work. So I've, I've uh, just at GDC, they just announced the um, the reboot of System Shock uh, from back in the day, uh, they're basically re- giving the entire original game a facelift, keeping all the same levels and monster placements and all that. Uh, it looks exactly the same, but they're basically rehauling everything. And so, at the moment, I'm I'm involved among other projects in in that one. So it's kind of it's definitely like a side gig, but it's really been allowing me to uh, keep my uh, video game creation know how up to up to speed very cool and who's who's is it the same publishers of system shock i who owns system shock now well that that was a big question so essentially um for a very long time uh there was it was in legal limbo the 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 system shock franchise wasn't being sold anywhere you couldn't even find it anywhere except i think on games on demand or no is it what geo what is it games on good good old games good old games that's the one sorry um I think you could get it on that, but then even that stopped for a while, um, essentially because there was there was a, a, a fight going on. Um, the original studio, I think, had largely disbanded. Um, the publisher was trying to hold on to it, but they didn't have anyone to make it. And and there was a, basically multiple claims were laid uh, laid uh, upon that franchise because it's a powerful name, right? I mean, most gamers yeah. these days know Bioshock, but you only have to be a couple, just a couple years older than those gamers to know that System Shock came before. And that was a heavily influenced on Bioshock series. And uh, 
I think the, in, in recent years, this company called Night Dive uh, finally kind of pushed its nose into the pile. Um, kind of, I don't know what they had to do, what legal wrangling they had to do to acquire the rights, but they acquired the rights, they resettled it, um, and they re-released System Shock 2 on Steam, and now they're doing an actual uh, rehaul of the original. So, and yeah, so I'm, I'm, and I'm a fan of the franchise. I played System Shock a little bit, but I played System Shock 2 a lot. Um, mm -hmm. So it's been really fun to kind of retroactively be a part of my dreams, of my, of my nostalgia. Yeah, yeah, really cool. And the reason why I wanted to ask about that was just because there's so many properties or titles or whatever that as fans are just like, why isn't there another X? Right. You know, whatever that title is coming out. And it's not because the creators don't want it to be. You know, you see these things where the – I know like uh, America McGee has his Alice franchise and I believe that EA owns that. So he's – sort of has his hands tied in a, in a certain degree and there's a lot there's lots of that that's just one example of many and system shock is is another one that I wasn't sure cuz I felt like that was a really popular game it seems like any game that has an existing fan base the studios love that because there's people who will buy it right from the beginning you don't have to to, to take a huge risk i think that's that's exactly what we're seeing in video games and in movies these days is that yeah studios um, put out put out a lot of cash uh, to, for games these days and for, for movies. And I think that they really only want to bank on the franchises that people know. I mean, this is why the Smurfs just got made into a movie. You know, I mean, ki kids these days do not watch the Smurfs. We watch the Smurfs. But this is exactly, <laughs> they're trying to cash in on us. You know, the Smurf generation is now having toddlers. And they're like, well, I, my kid doesn't know who the Smurfs is, but I know who the Smurfs are. And I'll go take my kid to this because, you know, it's, some, it's, it's tangentially connected to my childhood. Nostalgia is nostalgia is in. Let's put it that way. So I, I want to ask about. Um, so you you left the industry, and I, I find it is kind of has some parallels. That I had a a long career more in the 3D side, but then I left, and I wanted to start Pencil Kings and to start bringing the knowledge of expert artists to people and putting them inside a community that was really safe. That was one of the things that I always felt like I had dealt with bullies and haters and. Even as an adult, I have I had this huge troll hater and his cohorts coming after me on social media. It was not fun. Um, most people aren't like this. But anyway, I want to create this space. And so I, f I see a similarity there. Is that why you wanted – were you just like slowing down after the time at Bessoff or you had a different calling or, or what was – what what changed or, or what made the, 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 the deviation? That's a good question. Deviation is such a, such a bad word. Yeah. But <laughs> The, the change. What made the change? Um, that's a good good question. Um, I think we at Bethesda, we're definitely no stranger to trolls. I think that uh, especially with the Fallout franchise and the kind of Bethesda picking up that franchise, blowing off the dust and getting to work. I think especially before the release of Fallout 3, we saw a lot of hate uh, coming in. Um, we even got a security guard guarding the building for the first time because we were getting bomb threats and all that. You know, people... And it's so wow. it's so strange that such hate would come pouring out of the internet because of of the amount of love that was the candle that was held for the original franchise. I think after mm -hmm. Fallout Three got released, people eased up and realized that it wasn't so bad. And then Fallout Four, I think, is even even in some ways, uh, uh, in some ways, more of a return to the original franchise. In some ways, it's it's deviated uh, uh, on its own. In the end, though, it was not uh, that at all that uh, got me out because I think that actually the amount of love people give to Bethesda games far outweighs the hate, even though there's like, you know, like obviously like Bethesda is, is a little bit renowned for bugs and that kind of thing. But, you know, a lot of that is the fact that they're such a tiny studio and nobody knows that. Um, they're really, really small. So it had a lot less to do with that. Um, I really actually felt very loved and embraced by the community um, because I think that, again, like the Elder Scrolls franchise as well as the, the Fallout franchise does inspire real love because um, it's not about here, let's, let's force feed you entertainment. It's more like here is an entire world and this world is yours and you are the, you are the wherever you go, you are the center of the world. And that's, and, and having those adventures on your own really instilled in people some really good feelings. So I definitely, years later, I still feel very buoyed by that community. It's been very lucky for me. Um, really what inspired the change was that um, my wife had moved up to New York. Um, she was going to attend law school. And 
we'd already been apart for two years and I'd been in Bethesda for seven years. And it wasn't that I'd just been in Bethesda for seven years, but I'm from Maryland. I'm from the Maryland area. So I, okay. you know, my, there was high school friends around and there was my parents and there was kind of this history, you know, and, and, you know, when you're growing up and, uh, and maybe you can relate to this because you just, you know, we're talking about how, you know, bullies affected your life, you know, at a certain point, you do want, you almost need like a change of scenery in order to feel that you yourself can now, can leave behind the things that trouble you and kind of develop into the person that you really want to be and that you should be. Um, I saw a great quote by, by David Bowie on Twitter this morning that was something like, you know, as you get older, you grow into the person that you always wanted to be. And I think that's, that's a really good point. And I think that le leaving Maryland um, was important for me to really grow, I think. Um, leaving Bethesda was painful, but I had been there for seven years, which is, you know, almost like going to college twice. Um, and at that point, I really, I loved the people I was surrounded with. I felt challenged by my coworkers. I felt supported and, you know, I got to be a part of something really beautiful. But at the same time, uh, I didn't feel challenged as a human anymore. Um, as a game artist, sure, I was learning new tricks and I was, you know, every creature that I made, whether it was the the troll or the giant or the the feral ghouls or the mire lurks or the death claws or the super mutants, each one presented, presented its own suite of challenges. And so it wasn't as if I wasn't learning on that level, but on a deeper, more human level, I felt like I was beginning to stagnate a bit. And, um, you know, to, I, I got that job at, at Bethesda pretty early on um, after, after graduating from college. It was a very lucky story. And so it, what that meant ultimately was that I was living a very pampered lifestyle. It was not pampered, cushy. It was very cushy. I was making, I had a good living. Um, I was at a great job. I could literally have just stayed there forever um, and been, you know, been, been happy with that. But, you know, um, at the time I was, I think, 30 and 33 now, um, or maybe I was 29. I can't remember. I don't know. I don't know. Math. Math is hard. Art, art is good. Bath bad. Um, I really um, needed to grow. And, and I've been thinking about this story for a long time. And in fact, I've been spending a lot of my time um, reading all these books about screenplay writing and then writing this story as a screenplay, draft after draft after draft and cutting and moving and things around. And one of the, the problems with me working at Bethesda was that I was a, a game artist and I had worked to become uh, very good at my job. Um, I took a lot of pride in that, but what that ended up doing to me, I, I both got what I wanted and, and didn't realize that sometimes what you get, when you get what you want, it's not necessarily a good thing. I was given, uh, all this delicious meat of character design and all that, but then I wasn't giving it any power in any other realm of development. I had all these ideas for stories and for, um, other elements of the game, but I didn't, I didn't have the power um, or the knowledge for that matter to, to institute it. So all I had was, you know, limited influence. Um, and after a while I just decided, you know what, if I'm going to continue to grow as a person and if I am going to be somebody who pursues his dreams and can say honestly to himself that he's always gone after what he's wanted, then I need to leave. I need to go be with my wife. She's my girlfriend at the time, but we were definitely, we'd already been dating for, uh, I want to say six years or something. She was the one. I, I needed to be with her. I wanted to support her, um, and I needed to change. And so I came up here to New York, and and it was um, quite jarring. Uh, but in the end, I really believe it was one of the best moves I've ever made. And I I love that you told that story. Um, I haven't talked about it very much, but I feel. It, very very similar that when you leave your home it's like you have to you your experience as a human since we're talking about growing as a human your experience becomes accelerated so for me i went overseas to china and i felt like going overseas where it's a different language and and whatnot it's like two years of human growth in one year of of time around trip around the sun and that's really cool because there's there's so many parts of yourself that you didn't know that were there or didn't strengths that you had or weaknesses that you, you need to work on that you didn't know about. And you get to learn about all this stuff. And like you said, challenge yourself and grow. And it's, it's a really good feeling. 
It's a it's a really good feeling, and it's definitely not an easy feeling. I mean, I definitely I definitely suffered, and I didn't realize actually that I was suffering when I got here. I thought that when I got to New York, and lo and behold, I did not have to wake up for a job, and I could you know I could lounge about the house, and I would look. I I finally I'm writing. Look at me. I'm a I'm a writer, and I would I would go to the coffee shop, and I would write, and and that lasted for maybe two months, and then I began to feel you know winter started coming in, and I began to feel odd and I didn't know why and then I started to get and I won't get into it because it's a long story in and of itself but I began to get what I thought were asthma attacks and what I eventually learned were panic attacks um, essentially because I think that uh, you know like yourself you had gone to China and you had really thrown yourself kind of in, in, in the deep end and, and specifically thrown away the floaters right like you just throw yourself in there and see you know I'll just swim and I'll be fine and I think that uh, what I had perceived to be and was on the surface a very cushy, fun, freeing change of lifestyle, I think subconsciously I was freaking out about because I think that I, in my head, I realized, what did I do? <laughs> I had a job at Bethesda Software, which is like <laughs> one of the best companies ever. I was doing some of the coolest work there. Like I did, you know, I had a great job. I was near my friends and my family, all these systems of support. And now here I am in the city, in this apartment. And I don't know the city very well. You know, I just moved to Brooklyn. I don't know the city well. Um, I have friends here, but they all have jobs and they're gone during the day. And I'm writing a book. And what the hell do I know about writing a book? I've never written a book in my life. And I was trying to paint uh, illustrations for the book. And, you know, while art has been my background, I've never really done painting. And so here I am saying, what, what did I do? <laughs> I have made a terrible mistake. I have to flee. Um, and I think that that was what I was feeling. And so... Eventually, I learned to you know let go of that feeling, and actually, the the anxiety attacks did pass. And I think over the last couple of years of of writing and of of painting, and then of doing, um, I embarked for a while on a, on an independent video game, an indie video game with a former coworker of mine and his friend, and that was really fun and very hard, and it ultimately crashed. But I've learned just an enormous amount, and I actually wouldn't give it away for you know I have, <laughs> I have less money now than ever, and I'm actually very very happy, you know, um, and presumably <laughs> you know I think I think this year, I should finish the book, and I have I'm working now like I said on System Shock, so I have money now coming finally. Um, but it was, it was tough at first, but I, I agree with you completely. I think that, I now am more fully equipped to face so much more of what life will bring me. And I feel so much more just confident and happy. Okay, so I wanna talk a little bit about, actually the, the panic attacks, if you're okay to talk about it, because it's, it's a sure. theme that I've uh, had some really, whenever I've had the most response from from the people that I've worked with over the years or the people that I've had you know my tiny little bit of influence over is when I've talked about my health issues when I worked too much uh, at, at an outsourcing studio and I needed to take seven months off because my back was having spasms and I couldn't sleep and yeah. it was really bad um, there, there are real health risks with being an artist um, and then another one was a podcast that we did with a um, an artist who was doing vehicle design and one basically like one day he just lost all of his talent and he was in the throes of a depression. And then recently, like for myself, um, and the reason why I kind of want to talk about it is because I've been going through a depression for a period of time and I thought I was like, I was just so alone. I would walk, I would go to Starbucks to, cause I, I'm working on a book also so many similarities here, but right. I went to, would go to Starbucks to write on a book and I would start to walk and I just started crying like uncontrollably. And I'm like, what's going wrong? Like what's happening with me? I'm becoming unhinged from reality. Right. This is so weird. But then I started talking to a lot of people about this. And what I found was, what I found was weird was that I had gone for so long without this happening. That for a lot of people, this happens much sooner. So when you've had a run of, I'm 34 now, so basically 15 years of having life throw its best and worst at you, and you've come through pretty well, and then all of a sudden you hit a point where it's so difficult and you become unhinged, like you just, it's like you can't depend on yourself anymore. You're like, what is going on? Right. And um, so with these panic attacks, um, I'm curious if you 
found anything that really helped or, or how you worked through that process so you're able to kind of get back? Because it sounds like you're in a good place now, again, like you're in your groove. And I don't know how bad it was or how much you want to go into it, but I feel that maybe more than helping people with their drawing and, and careers and that kind of stuff, that this is a more important message. And sure. so if you're open, I would like to just explore it for a little bit. Yeah, totally, man. Um, yeah, I mean, it's funny that you mentioned all that because I remember I was on a stream the other day, I think it, it, it may have been my own stream, or, or actually Adobe um, has me sh streaming on their channel part time. And I think I brought this up, and the chat room came alive with people who were saying they had similar issues, or that they had depression issues, or they had, you know. And it's it's it really wakes you up to just the fact that this is happening to so many more people. And I think that that's important to remember because when you are in the midst, when you're stuck in a tough place and you're and you're depressed. Whether you know whether somebody can label that clinically depressed or simply you're just having a bad time, you feel profoundly alone, and that's I think that is um, it's important to know that that you are not alone. That the world is full of people who feel terribly alone, and and that those feelings are totally okay. Um, I think that you know kind of like you said, like I had I had felt like you know I had this kind of cushy life and things were going very well, and then here I came into this situation that on the surface seemed like the best thing that could possibly happen to me and actually uh, emotionally uh, was devastating. And um, it didn't go on for more than a couple months. I, I'm a generally pretty happy guy, um, pretty carefree. I think that the important ways of crawling back out of that had a lot to do with being honest with myself and addressing my problems head on. So. Um, you know, I, at first I couldn't breathe. And so I thought these are, these are asthma attacks and I'd had some asthma as a child and it didn't feel quite the same, but I did know that I couldn't breathe. Um, and it got, mm -hmm. you know, got so worse that at one point I got to, you know, I think it was the day before hurricane Sandy rolled into to New York, my wife rushed with me to the hospital nearby because I actually, I really couldn't breathe. Um, and they hooked me up to a nebulizer and I sat there for hours inhaling and it really wasn't getting better. And I was like, that's weird. I've had asthma before. I've had bronchitis. And the nebulizer helps so much. Um, and then after a while, Julia said, this is Julia, my wife, um, I, I don't think these are panic. These are asthma attacks you're having. I think these are panic attacks. And I kind of initially, like, you know, poo-pooed the idea. And then I was like, maybe you're right. And then we were going into the city. We were going from Brooklyn to Manhattan one day. And in the subway ride, my chest is clamping up more and more and more. And by the time I come out the other end, I'm kind of freaking out, you know. Um, and Julia says, you know what, let's call my uncle. Her uncle's a, a, a doctor. Um, and maybe you can ask him, you can tell him what's wrong, and then maybe you can ask him for a prescription for Xanax or something. And I calmed a little bit at the suggestion, and I called her uncle. We had a five-minute conversation where he said, yeah, no, it sounds like you're having, you know, panic attacks. This does sound like it. I will prescribe you the minimum amount of Xanax. And what's funny about that is that at the end of that conversation, I could breathe fine. And I actually, I think he gave me like a couple pills that I never even took because once I knew for a fact that these were panic attacks and that actually physically I could breathe, um, it got a little better. And it got better for a couple of weeks. And a lot of it had come down to the fact of like, Great. Now me and my powerful brain is equipped with the knowledge to know that this is a panic attack, not a physical thing. Uh, I can deal with this. This is all in the mind. Um, that worked for a couple of weeks. And then they started coming back and it was worse than ever. Not, not the symptoms were worse than mm. ever, but my anxiety was worse than ever because I just felt plagued. How do I get rid of this? This is just, this is the worst feeling and it's incessant. Um, and that's when my wife sent me down again and said, uh, listen, you know, yes, these are in your mind, but that doesn't necessarily mean you can control it and you shouldn't try to. You shouldn't try to grapple with it head on and say, down, demon, you know, like, you know, get a, be gone. It doesn't work that way. And so what she said, what you need to do is you need to just tell yourself, okay, I'm having a panic attack. This sucks. I will just breathe. I'll just breathe slowly. I'll breathe deeply. And I know for a fact now that I am fine and that this will pass. And that helped an enormous amount. So that knowing A, what was happening to me, gave me some 
power over myself, knowing B, that I should not try to control it because the brain is a powerful thing. And when it decides to send emergency signals to the rest of your body, like good luck getting in the way of that. You're not going to do it. To, to, to basically kind of relinquish control of the moment and not try to fight it is, is huge because it's only going to hurt worse. And then kind of back to the, the origin of it all, I think really coming face to face and really trying to delve deep into myself and try to explore the reasons why I might be freaking out. That was huge because I think that um, we all have difficulties in our lives, whether those are career-oriented or love-oriented or friendship-oriented or family-oriented or health-oriented. You know, they, there's all kinds of pressures, and they're not going to let up over our life, but our ability to cope with them can definitely and certainly be strengthened. I thought that at the time, like I said, that everything was great, that here I was in New York, and I was writing a book, and I was pursuing my dreams, and nothing could be better. And subconsciously, I realized that my safety net had been, from almost all angles, Felt like it had been severed um, and that here I was moving from a, a world that I knew and was a master of to a, a, a peon in like a not even a peon because I think when you call yourself a peon that means that you work for something I, I was one little insect in like a world that no longer cared about me um, you know what I mean and so I think that once I realized that actually that was what I was thinking in my head and that you know this beautiful apartment I have that I still live in that I love uh, it was beginning to feel like a prison. You have moved to New York. You have moved to this apartment. You have de you've dedicated yourself and you have sworn to everybody you know that you will write this book and you will illustrate this book and you will make it beautiful and you'll make the words pretty and you'll do this and that. And here you are with the woman that you're going to marry. Wow, I felt trapped. So coming to grips with the causes um, and, and realizing that uh, it was not actually a physical thing and learning to let go, these things really calmed me down. And after a couple of months, it just kind of went away. And I'm proud to say that I don't really get them anymore. And, and, and that isn't to say that my life is perfect by any means, but I just, I've, for the moment at least, moved past that. I actually had a similar experience that I didn't know where it was coming from. I felt unhinged. And then once I was able to, uh, like, like I was going to somebody and talking through this and trying to figure out what it was and trying to figure it out. And once I figured it out and it was, what I think it was, was that I, I had a relationship that I, you know, it wasn't, I realized that it wasn't going to be what it was. And it was like the feeling of loss of this relationship that I like, uh, so wanted it to work. And then it, so that was on one side. And then on the other side, um, that I had somebody who was helping me with pencil kings to push it, to be more and to be more bigger. And that's what I thought that I wanted. And those two things coming together just led me to this place where I just didn't know what to do. And I couldn't function. Like I couldn't do my work. I would sort of, uh, I filled up my days with something. I don't know what, but I, it wasn't productive. Right. Um, it, it wasn't destructive either. It just, I'm used to producing things all the time. So it was really weird. And I was like, I can't, get it working. But once I figured out that it was these things that I was feeling upset about, and then I started to, I allowed myself to let go of, it's like, okay, you know, you can be sad about the relationship. People get, you know, a, a good relationship is something to, to cherish. And it, the fact that it didn't work out is really sad. And, and people go through this. Um, and then also giving up that, okay, I, I won't be uh, the, the biggest art site or whatever it is that I thought I was working towards before. It's okay to let that go. It's okay to just like go back to your basics, connect with your community. Who are the people that you're trying to help? Call one of them, send them an email. Hey, how, how can I help you? This starts the ball moving in the right way. And the, and the thing that really got me back, I, I was trying diet. I cleaned up my eating. I started taking vitamin D because it's winter. Okay. I went to the doctor. I got my blood checked because I thought, am I going crazy? I don't know. He, I, I was a little bit low on B12, so I started taking the B12. None of that really pushed me over. And uh, I, I was like physical activity, so I would walk every day for half an hour. But what pushed me over the edge where I finally felt like myself again was I went for a run. I went yeah. for a hard run. Yeah. And that day was like a normal like, oh, still what's the point of anything day? Right. And the next day, back to normal. Happy, joking, <laughs> not taking things too seriously. Let's move forward. We can do anything. We can accomplish anything. But it was really like understanding that I wasn't going crazy because I was really worried for a while. Yeah. And the other thing is that just like your story, there's similarities, but I've had many of these stories now. And so I feel like 
if you're listening to this and this sounds familiar, maybe talk to some of those people that care about you who are around you and you realize that people aren't willing to talk about this stuff that much, but I'm trying to be a little bit more forthcoming because I want you to feel good, you know, everyone. Yeah, absolutely. I think, I think like, I, like, like you're mentioning and I mentioned earlier, I mean, I think it's hard for people to admit that and to admit that they're having a hard time. And especially if there's not even one thing in their life that's going terribly wrong and yet they still are plagued with these feelings. Um, yeah, it's definitely hard to, but I think reaching out is important. Um, I think, um, you know, friends are important and identifying what friendship is and, and, you know, it's, it's giving to somebody and, and, um, supporting one another, very important. And, and strangely enough, like you said, um, exercise, I actually like make exercise. I go to the gym or go for a run or something. I try to do that around four times a week. Um, and I would like to do more if I had more time, I totally would. Um, because we forget that like we are animals and that, um, there is no animal in history that has ever um, had that could ever make a living sitting at a desk for eight hours and then going home and then sitting down to eat and then watch, sitting down to watch a movie, and um, and you forget that 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 affects you deeply. That like your that evolutionary biologically, your body's very confused as to why you never move and do anything. Um, and I think we just we just forget in this day and age that like that, that that is actually a critical element. And I can't remember the word for it, but the Greeks had this word uh, that, and again, I can't remember. Um, it it meant perfection in both body and mind. Um, and the idea oh, virtuous was that it? Virtuous? I, I believe it was virtuous. I was listening to a uh, oh cool this recently. It, I think I think it may have like um, the word may have have I think definitely the word has changed obviously. But I think that that's probably exactly like the the meaning, um, and essentially what it meant is it didn't mean like you're perfect, like you know, like you you are model perfect. It just means that you are constantly working to improve, to 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 exercise both your brain and your body, and that is what leads to kind of this this clean and healthy living where you know you don't need six pack abs. It, you just need to go out for a run, you know, like a couple times a week. And your body, it, 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 I'm not, you know, I'm not going to say that it fixes things, but it, it helps dramatically, I think. And it's always worth it. It's always worth it. And it's, and especially when you're feeling low, it's very hard to motivate, but that's actually when you want, when you need to do it more than ever. So yeah, I'm a huge proponent of, of working out. I think in that article you just read, uh, that I wrote for Kotaku about Adam Adamowitz, um, who's a, was a concept artist at Bethesda. Um, he worked out almost every day. He went home and worked out super hard before doing even more art every night and um, drinking a bottle of wine. Uh, that Yeah, it was definitely something he did a lot. And I, I'm definitely trying to model my life off of this, guys. All right, well, we're, we're almost out of time here, but I want to talk a little bit about the upcoming projects so that we can kind of set the expectations so I know when to follow up next or when people can look for. Is the book the first project that's coming out or is there other things that are... I guess System Shock isn't necessarily yours, but and that will have a huge push behind it. I'm more interested in, in your projects and, and if we can get behind those and, and lift those up a little bit more. Sure, man. I really appreciate that. Um, yeah, so the, the the book that I'm working on now, it's a fantasy novel. And if people are interested in, in the uh, in a little bit of the story, the synopsis, they can look on my website, um, just jonahloeb.com. I'll just give just a very brief synopsis. Um, it's a story about a, it's a fantasy novel set in kind of a medieval uh, level world about a girl who's an orphan and she's the last of her kind. And she, it's kind of about her struggling to find her, who she is and, and where she belongs and what she's supposed to do because as she's the last of her kind uh, and her kind are, they're called Alvani. And they're the, the, the quote unquote, the dreaming people. And they have these dreams that are very vivid and they're very in touch with dreams and dreams being kind of visions, right? And so nobody really can advise her. And so she's very much looking for her own way. And, and that's when kind of crisis strikes where the people who, mur who were the armies who murdered all of her people return to the land. And for some reason they're trying to abduct her and she, she flees um, she's only 12. She flees and meets up with um, a very grim 
uh, dark assassin whose whose mind seems to be slowly unraveling. And but between the two of them, they have to figure out a way to defeat this this strange resurgence uh, of this army. And also, she has to figure out a way to defeat the demon that has been plaguing her and stalking her dreams and getting closer and closer. And it's it's been a passion of mine for a long time. I, I would love to tell you the name, but every name I pick has already been picked by, by books before. And so I keep I keep just howling in frustration every time I find the perfect name for it. And I realize someone else already found the perfect name. But if you are interested, you can go onto my website and, and, and just write your name down to sign up. I will not and have never written anybody, and I won't until uh, a couple months from now, I presume, when I get an agent. Um, I have finished the book. I am now in the midst of revisions. It's going really well. I'm very, very pleased with it. Um, I still have a little ways to go, but I'll be pitching it to, to book agents uh, in the next month or two. And I have... I'm feeling pretty confident, to be honest with you, because I've been reading some of my competition, and I don't know, man. I, I, it sounds cocky, but I just I love it. And you know what? This is a story that I've been writing and or in one form or another or thinking about for a decade, um, and not just thinking about it conceptually, but thinking about it on a scene by scene basis. So it's just a lot of time to think on something. And if I can't come up with something good uh, in all that time, then maybe I'll just go back to Bethesda. But I really, I really love it. It's really uh, a passion project of mine. And if you don't feel like signing up on my website, you can just find me on Twitter, find me on Instagram, and and don't worry, you'll hear about it then when the time comes. Um, so that that will be, I presume, that will come out in some form or other this year, because um, as as I understand it, once you get picked up, it things happen pretty fast. But you know, you never know. I am, um, I am a huge proponent of of failure as a means to success. Uh, so in applying for anything, in trying anything, in, in going through, in jumping through any hoop, you're going to encounter lots and lots of failure. But I, I've reached a point in my own life where I don't let that daunt me anymore. Um, I don't let that bother me. I just know that failure is it's just one more thing that you're going to forget about when success finds you. So I, you know, like, yes, I feel good about the book. But yes, I also anticipate that I'll get rejections uh, from a number of different sources. But I'm... I will get it made, damn it. I'll get it made. Um, so that's that's the big thing. Other than that, um, I would say, yeah, keep your eyes on System Shock. It's it's looking pretty. Um, I might be doing work uh, on a couple other projects, and you'll hear about them as things go. But but that's, yeah, that's where my life is at right now. Awesome. Well, thank you for being, like, following your passion and in being an inspiration, I think, for so many people. Because I know that we often talk to on this podcast to people who are starting their creative journey, but I know that there's a lot of creatives who are working in the industry. Um, like you were, like I was that are like, wow, how did you do that? How did you go and do the thing that you wanted to do? It's like, how could you not do it? Right. 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 Uh, it's, it's, and it's not all roses, but, um, yeah, I, I applaud people who are willing to take the leap, the leap of faith and, um, kind of shine a light for other people who want to do the same. So, Thank you so much, Jonah. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. My pleasure. Yeah, and to anybody who, and to anybody who needs a, a, a daily feed of, of, of inspiration and or if you want to go online and watch me fail, you can go to uh, Twitch. I have a channel on Twitch, and I'm on there most days. And if I'm not on there on that day, I might have very well been on the Adobe channel at some point that day. And so you can just watch me suck it at art all the time too. So come on. <laughs> come join the party. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. This is the end of the podcast, and uh, we'll be back next week with another interview. Don't demand patience, skill, years of practice. Ah, you talk like a fool. I would trade a century of practice for an ounce of inspiration.